Hello, welcome back to SkepVet TV. I'm Dr. Brandon McKenzie, and I'm the SkepVet. We have the crisp nip of fall in the air, at least as much as we ever get in California, and we're getting close to Halloween, which I am very excited about, as you can see from the decor in my office. Today I'm going to talk about vaccination for cats. But first, I have to start with the usual disclaimer, which is that nothing I say in these videos is intended to be specific advice for your individual pet. If you have to make decisions about which treatments to use or not to use for your pet, you should make those decisions together with your veterinarian. Okay, let's get started. So my video last week was about vaccination for dogs, and many of the principles for vaccines and how they work apply exactly the same to cats as they do to dogs. So I'm not going to go into great detail about vaccines and how they work, just a little quick recap so that we can get started on the guidelines for cats. Kittens are not born with protection against infectious disease. They uh, acquire antibodies from their mother in the first 24 hours of life or so by nursing, and these antibodies provide them with some protection against infectious organisms. However, these antibodies can also interfere with the vaccine's ability to teach the immune system to recognize infectious agents. So if we vaccinate too early when a kitten's antibody levels are high, then the vaccine won't generate the kitten's own personal antibody memory response, and they may not be protected in the long term. If we wait until too late when the maternal antibodies have largely gone away, then we've missed an opportunity to help protect that kitten, and they've had a period of vulnerability to these diseases. The solution to this problem is a series of vaccines that are given from the time that the kitten is about six or eight weeks of age, when it's old enough that its immune system can potentially respond to vaccination properly, until about 16 to 20 weeks of age, when we're fairly sure that most cats have lost enough of their maternal antibodies that the vaccines will generate a full protective response. So as for dogs, cats are typically vaccinated on a schedule about every three to four weeks from six to eight weeks of age until about 16 to 20 weeks of age. After that initial series, booster vaccines are given in a manner that is dependent upon the individual lifestyle of the cat, the particular diseases they may be exposed to, and how individual vaccines work, how long they last, that sort of thing. So we'll get into the details. As with vaccines in dogs, there is a very large and complex scientific literature that investigates vaccines for cats, the diseases they get, the vaccines that protect against them, how long they last, what their risks are, all of the important things we need to know to make recommendations to our clients as veterinarians. It is very helpful for veterinarians in practice that there are guidelines put together by committees of experts who have reviewed the scientific literature and made some assessment of it. The guidelines that I use most commonly in helping to produce recommendations for my cat-owning clients are the guidelines produced by the World Small Animal Veterinary Association and by the American Academy of Feline Practitioners. As with dog vaccines, the guidelines break the vaccines for cats into two rough categories, core and non-core. Core vaccines are typically given to all cats, with some exceptions, because they vaccinate against diseases which are either quite common or quite serious. Non-core vaccines can still be useful, but they either are vaccines which have less efficacy and so may not provide as much protection, or they vaccinate for diseases that are not as common or only certain individual cats are likely to be exposed to them. So they're not widely recommended for all cats, but they may be useful for some. The core vaccines in the guidelines for cats are those that protect against feline herpes virus, feline calici virus, and feline panleukopenia virus. Those first two, feline herpes and feline calici, are respiratory infections. These are very common diseases, and almost all cats will be exposed to them, so the vaccines for feline herpes virus and feline calici virus are considered core vaccines. So the purpose of the feline herpes virus and feline calici virus vaccines is not actually to prevent infection. The purpose of those vaccines is to reduce the severity of the clinical symptoms, to reduce the suffering that a cat will experience if they are exposed to these organisms. Now, this is still a very useful and important function for these vaccines. Even though they do not provide complete protection, they can reduce suffering significantly. Herpes virus and Khaleesi virus can cause very serious illness, particularly in young kittens or in older cats who have other diseases that might affect their, uh, the strength of their immune system. So your veterinarian will often recommend these vaccines even if your cat already has been infected with these organisms because the vaccines can still help provide protection against illness even if they don't prevent infection. Now, another core vaccine in some of the guidelines, but not all, is the rabies. While in many parts of the world dogs are the main source of rabies exposure for humans, 
in many parts of the developed world, such as the United States, where dogs are widely vaccinated and not typically allowed to run free, cats have actually become a more common domestic animal infected with rabies and potentially exposing humans. So it's very important that cats be protected against rabies. Vaccines other than the vaccines against feline herpes virus, virus, feline coronavirus, and feline panleukopenia, and rabies, depending on which guideline you look at, are considered non-core vaccines. These are vaccines that are not widely recommended, but may be appropriate for particular cats. Such vaccines include the chlamydia vaccine, bordetella, the FIP vaccine, and the FIV, or feline immunodeficiency virus vaccine. Your veterinarian may discuss some of these vaccines with you if your cat has particular individual risk factors that suggest that they might benefit from vaccination, but in general, the non-core vaccines are less widely used. Okay, so as I mentioned, as with dogs, vaccines for cats are used in adults in a way that is decided based on the individual risk factors that particular cats may have. There are guidelines for how often to give booster vaccines and which vaccines to use, but these are not rigid requirements that veterinarians follow blindly. These are simply suggestions based on what we know about the effectiveness and the duration of immunity of particular vaccines. Exactly what you vaccinate for and how often you vaccinate your cat will depend a lot on the individual lifestyle that your cat has. An indoor-only cat who is alone in a house, never exposed to other cats, and never going outside has fairly minimal risk of exposure to most infectious organisms. It is not unusual for veterinarians to recommend a kitten series and a six-month or one-year booster for such a cat, and then not to necessarily recommend vaccination ever again. The other extreme is a cat who lives almost exclusively outdoors and is frequently in contact with other cats whose health history and vaccine history you don't know. Uh, the barn cat is the classic example of this. So it is very common for cats who have an outdoor lifestyle to be regularly vaccinated with the FERCP vaccine. Typically every three years, uh, some people recommend longer intervals, but three years is a common practice. And the feline leukemia vaccine is often appropriate for cats with this outdoor lifestyle as well, typically boosted anywhere from every one to three years, depending again on which vaccine guideline you follow. There is some uncertainty about the duration of protection here. Rabies is also a very important vaccine because rabies is again a very serious fatal disease and not only for cats, but unfortunately for any humans who may be exposed to it as well. In between the strictly indoor cat and the outdoor only cat, of course, there's a wide range of lifestyles that cats lead. And what vaccine plan you put together for your adult cat will depend on your cat's particular lifestyle. I would definitely encourage everyone to discuss with your veterinarian what your cat's potential risk factors are, what the vaccines available are, and how effective and how long lasting they are, and to make an individualized plan for your cat. In talking about vaccination for dogs, I discussed the subject of antibody titers. Antibody titers are a way of measuring the antibodies that your cat has produced by vaccination, and that can sometimes give us a hint as to whether your cat is protected from a particular infectious disease and whether additional vaccine boosters are necessary. In dogs, this is fairly well established for several core uh, vaccines. However, the situation is a little different in cats. Antibody titers against feline panleukopenia virus do indicate protection. As with dogs, if your antibody levels are low, that doesn't necessarily mean you're susceptible, but often vaccination is recommended just to be safe. However, as I mentioned, the vaccines against feline herpes virus and feline calici virus do not produce what we call sterilizing immunity or perfect absolute protection against infection. Partly as a consequence of that, the antibody levels against these infectious diseases that your cat may have in their blood do not tell us reliably whether or not a vaccine will be beneficial. Your cat may still be vulnerable to a resurgence of clinical symptoms from one of these organisms, even if they have a high antibody level. So titers are not really very useful for the core vaccines against feline herpes virus and feline calici virus. Even if those titers are high, it may still be a good idea to vaccinate your cat if they're potentially exposed to these organisms. Similarly, vaccine titers are not useful for predicting protection against feline uh, leukemia virus, and so the use of this vaccine should be based on exposure risk, not on titer levels. Now, titers may be uh, useful in predicting resistance against rabies virus, but as I mentioned with dogs, it is not yet a legal substitute for vaccines in a situation where your cat is required to be vaccinated for rabies. Now, many jurisdictions do not require regular rabies vaccination of cats as they do for dogs. 
Despite the fact that cats are actually more commonly exposed to rabies in the United States than dogs are because of their outdoor lifestyle and because of less widespread use of vaccines. So in general, titers are probably not a very useful tool for deciding when to vaccinate your cat. As I mentioned before, I will be doing a complete video on the risks of vaccines, but I do want to talk about one particular vaccine risk that is uh, particular to cats and that cat owners know a lot about and are often very concerned about. And that is what we call feline injection site sarcomas. This is a type of very rare but quite serious cancerous tumor that has been associated with injections in cats, with vaccines certainly, but with other types of injections as well. In fact, initially it was called vaccine-associated sarcoma, but the name was changed when it was realized that it can be triggered by many other kinds of injections that your cat receives. Now again, I have to emphasize, this is a very rare disease. It depends on the area you're in, how commonly it's seen, and there are a number of different studies that show different levels. But even the most common occurrence in some areas is about one in every 5,000 cats. And there are some studies that find much, much lower rates. A more typical number is one in every 15,000, and in some areas as low as one in every 50,000. So this is not a common disease at all. However, because it's a very difficult cancer to treat, we do want to do everything we can to understand how it develops and what we can do to lower the risk for all of the cats that we see in our practice. One important thing to know is that we don't understand exactly how injection-associated sarcomas develop. It is theorized that inflammation caused by something that is injected under the skin in a cat may trigger a reaction in certain cells that then turn into cancer cells and lead to tumor formation. One early concern about injection site sarcomas was that they might be triggered by something called adjuvanted vaccines. Now, vaccines can either be live organisms that have been weakened, so they can't cause infection, but they can teach the immune system to generate a, a protective response, or vaccines can be what are called killed or subunit vaccines, where either a dead organism or only part of an infectious organism is included in the vaccine. Now, killed vaccines are less effective a stimulus to the immune system, and so sometimes something called an adjuvant is added to a killed vaccine, something that creates a stronger inflammatory response and wakes up the immune system so that it can respond more robustly to the vaccine. In the early days of understanding injection site sarcomas in cats, it was believed that the aluminum adjuvant used in certain cat vaccines, particularly rabies and feline leukemia vaccine, were a primary trigger for injection site sarcomas. That has since become controversial. Not all studies have found that association, and not all experts agree that aluminum adjuvants are responsible. It has, as I mentioned before, been shown that many other injections, including live vaccines that do not have adjuvants and other injections that are not vaccines at all, can trigger sarcoma development. So the role of adjuvanted vaccines versus non-adjuvanted vaccines is still a little bit controversial. Nevertheless, there are now non-adjuvanted or modified live vaccines for rabies and for feline leukemia in cats, and many veterinarians use these. We know these produce less inflammation. It has been really difficult to show that they actually reduce the risk of injection site sarcomas. We're hopeful that that's true, but that isn't very clear yet. Another thing that is done to reduce the potential risk for injection site sarcomas is giving fewer vaccines. And this has been a big motivator for the lifestyle-adjusted vaccine plan. Rather than vaccinating cats on a fixed schedule regardless of their lifestyle, we vaccinate cats based on how likely they are to be at risk for certain diseases. And this, for most cats, has significantly reduced the number of vaccines they receive. Something else that has been done to help with the problem of injection site sarcomas is, in many places, vaccines are now given in specified locations, particularly in areas where it may be easier to do a curative surgery if a tumor does develop. The tail or the what we call distal limb near the ankle or near the wrist are common sites that are used for vaccines in cats. And it has been shown that these vaccines work just as well as if they were given in the scruff over the shoulder, but that if tumors do develop, it is much easier to remove them and to treat them. Okay, so let's do a quick recap. Most kittens should be vaccinated from somewhere between six and eight weeks of age until they are 16 to 20 weeks of age with the core FVRVCP vaccine every three to four weeks. Most kittens should receive one rabies vaccine sometime after 12 weeks of age. It is very common then to give kittens a booster at either six or 12 months of age to make sure that if they didn't respond fully to the initial series, that they do have good long-term protection. 
Adult cats are vaccinated on the basis of an assessment of their individual risk. Cats who go outdoors are more likely to be exposed to infectious disease and more frequent vaccination is justified. Cats who are indoors only and not exposed to other cats have a lower risk of exposure and it may be appropriate to vaccinate less often for those cats. You should discuss the particular lifestyle of your cat and the particular risk factors in your area with your veterinarian and together make a plan for how to vaccinate your cats. I hope this has been helpful for you. My next video will be looking specifically at the risks of vaccines. There are certainly some real risks. I've talked about injection site sarcomas as one in cats today. There are also many risks that we aren't sure are actually real or that clearly are not real. And there are a lot of people online who will try to frighten you against vaccinating your pets. I think it's very important as a pet owner that you have accurate information so that you can make informed decisions about vaccinating in your cats or your dogs. So my next video will hopefully help you to do that. Thanks for watching. 